So the session is organized by um, Colin Anderson, who's over there, you wave, maybe some people see you, <laughs> and, um, and myself. Um, we, I'm Nina Möller, and we both work at the Center for Agroecology, Water and Resilience at Coventry University in the UK. Um, we're part of Agroecology Now, which is a collective um, at core at the center for bringing together and communicating a variety of research projects and actions that focus on social transformation for just and sustainable food systems. And for the last year or so, we've collaborated with, uh, with SITSE. And SITSE are a network of faith-based social justice organizations um, at the European level. And we've collaborated with them on a research program on financing agroecology. Basically, we wanted to know two things. We wanted to know how much money actually flows towards agroecology work, especially in terms of international aid. So from high income countries to lower income countries, but also as part of the global climate commitments, how much money actually goes towards agroecology. And second, what we wanted to know was what the conditions are that enable the money that is meant for agroecology to actually have a positive effect on the ground. And so in this session today, we wanted to, to share some of the outcomes of this research and, and some of our reflections on it. But um, the plan was to keep the, this relatively short, so the presentation part relatively short, um, because we're particularly keen to, to learn from all of you, to learn together with you from your experience, your ideas, your hunches, your hopes, your dreams. So after a relatively short moment of presentations, we will invite you to join some breakout rooms to have a focused discussion and we'll provide some guidance on the discussion later. And after these small group breakout discussions, we'll all come back together here and think about collective actions. So we'll think about how we can act collectively for political change, what needs to be done to properly resource agroecology. I hope that's clear. Um, I hope that's all good. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I will hand over to Colin to say a few words now, and then, um, then we'll dive straight in. Colin. Um, yeah, so Nina, it sounds like an ambitious agenda now that you've laid it out like that, but um, here we are. We'll see what we can get through. They might be a bit small, your slides. You need to just do them. How about that? Right Perfect. So um, yeah, so just very quickly um, to kind of set the context, I wanted to just talk a little bit about what agroecology is and what a transformative agroecology looks like. And so um, one of the things that uh, I also wanted to start off by saying is that when we think about financing agroecology, um, I like to talk about resourcing agroecology more broadly because agroecology is primarily, primarily resourced by farmers and civil society actors, the, actually the money that goes to finance agroecology and agroecology transitions and transformations is minuscule compared to the energy, um, materials, finances that go from everyday people into advancing agroecology. Um, and agroecology is really kind of built on that idea of grassroots agency, um, self-organization, and that's kind of what is the essence of agroecology. And so when we think about what, what happens when financing comes into agroecology, we have to think about how it can be done in a way that doesn't undermine that, that focus on, again, place-based, grassroots, eight, people's agency and food sovereignty is the kind of basis for agroecology. Um, so in this context, we, we see right now um, agroecology gaining a lot of kind of momentum and interest at different levels, both kind of at um, the international level down to the, the territory and to um, uh, national context where different actors, institutions are becoming interested in agroecology. And this has largely come about by efforts of social movements to push for this over the last couple of decades and especially in the last 10 years. And now we see lots of donors shifting attention saying, well, well wow, there's a, there's a really kind of this big drive and need to, for agroecology, it's becoming apparent that it's uh, necessary. And so um, what could we do to shift 
funds towards agroecology, how can we do it appropriately? And that's kind of the context for the questions that, that we um, were asking. So um, people, I mean, agroecology means different things to different people and has been kind of filled with meaning by a, um, the institutions that engage with it, farmers that are practicing it, scientists that are um, developing a, kind of a, a science around agroecology and the combination of all of those things. Some interesting and helpful ways to think about agroecology, and so agroecology being, you know, a, a number of things. And people talk about again a, a social move as a social movement, a set of practices, and a science and a way of understanding um, food systems and agriculture. But when we're so we're, we we want to think about that and the the redesigning of farming and food food systems based on a number of different principles, things like diversity and recycling, efficiency. Uh, the local knowledge and the co-creation of knowledge, deep connection with local culture and place, um, et cetera. But also we wanna think about how we move from one place, from wherever a farming or food system is at towards whatever an agroecological food system looks like. And so there's been a number of different ways people have, have um, talked about that. We um, have focused a lot on this um, in our group at Agroecology Now. We'd recently published a book called Agroecology Now that focuses on what transformations towards agroecology look like. It's available online for free. Um, I'll post the link later if you're interested. But one, one kind of uh, um, maybe simple way to think about it or is this, this framework that's been presented by Steve Gleesman and been adopted by quite a few different actors. This is um, a diagram put together by BioVision and they combine it with the FAO put together these principles of agroecology, which you can see um, on the right-hand side here, all these different principles that underpin what agroecology means, at least according to the FAO. And they've tried to glean this from engagement with scientists and with farmers and social movements. Um, but also this idea that there are different levels of, uh, of agroecology and of transition towards agroecology. And so the first three levels largely focus on the farm level uh, in the farm scale. And so level zero being there's no agroecology agro happening. Level one is sustainability is increasing just by increasing the efficiency of conventional farming systems. Level two is substituting alternative practice and bio inputs for chemical inputs and energies, external energies and inputs. And then level three is where transformation starts to happen is when whole farming systems are being redesigned based on these principles and elements of agroecology. You, as you move up, and this is something that we're uh, focused a lot on in our in our group, is the transformation of entire social, political, and economic systems to enable agroecology. And so, transformation involves in level four reconnecting farming and food systems with civil society, and especially be developing alternative systems of exchange and markets with with um, consumers in urban and rural areas. And level five being really thinking about what kind of fundamental transformations, not just in policies, but in the way we think about food and the paradigm in um, how in the cultures around food are necessary to create a system that's much more sustainable and just than what we have now. So this is the question that we brought to our work is what does a transformative agroecology look like? Not just that, but how might financing be able to support that again in ways that stay true to these elements and principles and the kind of political basis of agroecology based on food sovereignty. Um, I think that's where I pass it to you. Yep, over to you, Nina. Thanks, Colin. You're, you're still sharing your screen, there you go. Okay. So I'm also gonna share my screen. Can you see there a slide? Oh, it's not supposed to be that slide. It's supposed to be this slide. There we go. So, um, Colin, can you just give me a thumbs up if you see my screen well? Because I've lost you all there. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, yeah, financing agroecology. The question 
um, that uh, I'm going to address now in, in, in a few slides, potentially quite dry slides, a lot of um, graphs uh, and pie charts, but is what ma money actually flows towards agroecology, towards the kind of transformative agroecology that, that, um, that Colin has been, has been talking about. So the argument I'm, I'm going to make is, is pretty straightforward and it's not going to be surprising of any of you. Um, one, humanity is facing multiple interconnected crises which result from socially and ecologically destructive modes of production and consumption. Two, agroecology has the potential to restore, regenerate and, and enhance the socio-ecological systems upon which life depends allowing us to address these crises at their roots. Three, however, aid, development assistance and all sorts of other investments need to be channeled, are not channeled towards agroecology, but they need to be channeled away from petrochemical and carbon heavy food systems and towards agroecology now. Otherwise, it will continue to be undermined where it's being practiced and prevented from taking hold elsewhere. And so on that basis, I'm going to quickly show you some figures of recent studies, which underline that, that this sort of urgent action is, is really needed to shift funding priorities and investment realities as they are now. Um, despite an increasing recognition, Despite an increasing recognition and a plethora of international reports, organizations and platforms pointing to agroecology as crucial part of the solution, we have clear evidence that actual financial support for an agroecological transition remains minimal. And these are just a number of you know, high level reports that have, uh, have promoted agroecology over recent years. Since our first study on UK aid in 2018, there have been a number of other analyses focusing on development aid from European countries. So what you see here are different country studies that were all done over the last year or two. Um, and um, the green indicates, the green percentage indicates the funding flows that contribute to an agroecological transformation. So to agroecology um, at, at, uh, at, a, at level three of Gleesman, I'll come back to that, but to agroecology at, um, um, at, a, at a sort of more serious level rather than uh, just the usual sustainability tweaks. And you can see that with the exception of Switzerland, funding for agroecological agri transformation remains really very, very small. The UK figures here, in fact, they were based on an older methodology and they should actually show zero here in comparison with these other countries. That means that there was no UK funding whatsoever for agroecology between 2010 and 2017. Uh, just this week, a Dutch study has been finalized by the NGO Both Ends, which also shows that only about 4% of Dutch aid flows um, is are supportive of agroecological transformation. So the question has, of course, already been addressed by Colin in terms of what does actually agroecology mean you know, to us and in these studies. Um, and so what, what we have been looking at is um, projects that address level three, these levels um, have been proposed by Stephen Gleesman and they are, you know, they are usually understood as uh, levels for food system change. So they would be moving from increasing efficiency of industrial practices via the substitution of alternative practices to redesigning the whole agroecosystem and then to, um, you know, completely rebuilding the global food system. And only um, when projects addressed, uh, yeah, addressed level three, it actually were about redesigning the agroecosystems that were in place or really building um, new kind of food system, uh, new connections between farmers and consumers 
um, have have we classified these as uh, being supportive of an agroecological transition? So then I'm just going to quickly go through some of these slides. And again, these are just graphs and you don't have to understand now, have to not try and understand the whole thing. It's just um, to highlight that the, the Green Climate Fund, the agricultural projects that are funded by the Green Climate Fund, which is the financial mechanism of the um, UN Climate Change Convention, um, also only 10% address transformative agroecology. Um, and here 80, almost 80% 80 are basically for conventional agriculture. I'm also going to show you, this is not our own study, but this is a, a connected study of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And here as well, we have only 3% flowing towards agroecological transformation, possibly slightly unsurprisingly. And um, then this is a study of funding flows that have come into Kenya. So um, looking at money, development aid coming into Kenya, only 13% uh, are really supportive of a, of a proper agroecological transformation. So that is really all that I wanted to show. I'm going to go back to, um, to this slide just to keep it up there. Um, but I would like to conclude with a, with, a few, with a few thoughts. So in order to be supportive of an agroecological transition, an increase of funding per se would need to be backed by certain changes to the mode in which funding was made available to agroecology, especially with a view to supporting smallholder farmers and peasant associations who still feed the majority of the world. And there is no doubt that agroecology runs counter to the interest of big ag agribusiness. Its focus is firmly on democratizing the food system, at least if we take this kind of transformative political vision of agroecology. So the focus is on democratizing the food system and creating vibrant local, regional and global food economies that focus on health and nutrition for all and dignity of labor before profit. As such, it undermines the monopoly of the few and empowers farmers to participate in the creation of a food system which enhances ecological systems and enriches the human habitat. But this democratizing dimension of agroecology uh, needs careful reflection on which funding modalities, you know, private funds, public funds, blended funds, grants, loans, guarantees are best pursued in its support. And some studies demonstrate that, that public-private partnerships and blending finance mechanisms are not at all efficient ways to finance smallholder agriculture, and in fact, fact can be detrimental. Um, yet these are the, the modes that are above all pursued uh, in, in, in the current, current days. It's also far from clear that large grants are a solution. Rather, um, we suggest that it would be much more helpful uh, to see a complete divestment in industrial agriculture and corporate food systems and a total cessation of public funds in support of large agribusiness. And that's where I'm going to stop and stop sharing my screen. There. Colin, nice. I give over to you, hey? All right, thank you, Nina. Um, nice, so that, um, that sets us up to shift over into the, the second, what we call stream two of the research is, okay, well, once we um, can agree that more money needs to be shifted into agroecology, What's um, I'm frozen. Am I frozen? Am I okay? No. Okay, no. Yeah. What um, what is the quality and the approach and the methodologies of funding that are most suitable to a transformative agroecology? You've already mentioned, you know, some of the the kind of um, dynamics that Nina in your last points, but um, but our work uh focuses on this i'm just gonna share my screen bear with me for a moment
You can see this, Nina? Yes, yeah. I can see this. Again, smaller, if you can make them, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we went out um, engaged in a process of speaking with different kinds of people to ask questions about, you know, what are your, what have your experiences been in receiving funding as recipients from um, civil society organizations? Um, also people who are kind of resource people for agroecology and agroecology transitions from academia, from NGOs. But we also went out and talked to different donors who are viewed um, to be doing good things in regards to agroecology and especially um, particular people within those institutions and, and donors who um, kind of would have something to offer in that regard. And so we interviewed 17 people and we had five kind of couple hour long focus groups and then have been just engaging with people around it more informally for um, like the last year, um, particularly the last six months. Um, Fr uh, Ferris Ahmed is not here. He's a works is a kind of a co-researcher with us on this, and also Francois Devlo from Seed Save has been really instrumental in in this work on both sides. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Okay. So this don't you don't have to go into look too closely at this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put this back to you. But this is kind of like the main thing we have come to after like you know listening to talking with all these people listening and reading the transcripts and thinking and bringing it back uh, to, to some of these people to ask them what they think of our emerging ideas. And we started to look at what are the things that disable um, a transformative agroecology ways of financing and what are the things that enable it. And we've come to this kind of um, this emergent uh, framework and analysis. And so this isn't the final product. So you're kind of like catching it midway, but that talks about how it kind of there are these different dimensions and within those dimensions, there are um, dynamics that kind of um, move away from agroecology or transformative agroecology. And there are those that move towards it. And so things like, um, just pick one quickly, like things like um, monitoring and evaluation. How do you monitor a project? There are ways that can be done that, that um, kind of like carve out and, and erase parts of agroecology that are really important and there are ways that it can be done moving towards the kind of works for, works for transformative agroecology that supports that. And so I'm just gonna run through a few of these now to get our brains working and for you to think about how you um, relate to these in your own experiences, whether where, whatever you do, whether you're a farmer or someone who works in a university or a policymaker, kind of how, what strikes you as interesting and important because after I'm done presenting some of these ideas, we're gonna then break out into small groups and you're gonna get a chance to, to speak and meet some new people hopefully and discuss some ideas you know, as a way to, to yeah, get, um, take what we've presented and kind of root it in your own experience and your own ideas. So moving on. Um, okay, so one area is, that, is the idea of the governance of financing, how, um, what, how decision-making occurs about what gets financed um, and how it gets financed. So the, there is the idea that donors can pro provide opportunities for there to be co-governance with farmers and with social movements and civil society actors in ways that the priorities and the ways of funding is co-shaped by, um, by not just donors, but people who are kind of beneficiaries or recipients of funding. And that is contrasted with a one directional approach where all the decisions are made by a, a, a donor and there's very few mechanisms. And so a co-governance approach really lends itself towards um, kind of a place-based agroecology and making sure that things are suitable for um, what's going on in particular territories. So people talked about uh, having funding relationships built, built on principles of solidarity and mutual connection. And that things that were in place to enable that were, you know, formal mechanisms for internal dialogue with with partners and people who are receiving fundings, and like mechanisms to shift things based on that. Having monitoring and evaluation being kind of like co-shaped by um, recipients and farmers, and having these kind of processes in place that really enables that. So one donor talks about we have a complex network of advisors with eyes and ears to the ground, as so they've invested a lot in having people embedded in places involved in shaping uh, decision making around um, financing. Um, so other ideas were instead of the donor making all the decisions, having 
uh, kind of funding put in place where decisions about how it is divvied out is actually taken by kind of intermediate grassroots organizations. And so farmers, for example, have their own pot of money that they can regrant. Um, and again, project advisory committees, donors and com uh, communities on, on um, kind of mutual governing bodies. And so this really resonates with the idea of, of um, democratizing food systems, food sovereignty, acknowledging the importance of the agency of people in deciding their own food systems and how they're financed and resourced by external actors. Another area is kind of moving away from um, just like just thinking about a farm level and having interventions at a farm level approach towards taking a territorial approach. And so there's been a lot of people talking about the territorial approach as being kind of vital yet underappreciated um, way to support agroecology. And so that a territory being somewhere kind of in between the household and the community, and the international and the national where um, agroecology can really thrive if there's an investment in, and there already is, there are people developing territorial food systems, but um, rather than just focusing on a farm level, we have these other uh, kind of approaches. And so the idea is not to focus on a, a particular sector, grains, livestock, fruits and vegetables, but to take a territorial approach that thinks about how all these things fit together and work in a particular place. So with that, there is a lot of people asking for an emphasis on peasant to peasant learning and horizontal learning, organi organizational processes in territories, thinking about the links between um, you know, food and energy and healthcare and education systems in a particular territory, rights to land, water and seeds being really important in territories. And that in particular, that agroecology transitions are, are a political process in each territory has its own political process in place. And you can't have a cookie cutter approach where something that works somewhere else in another territory or in, on another farm can just be taken and put in a particular place. So a territorial approach really demands that donors understand what's happening in a place, be connected to it and empower people within that place to engage in the political processes that allow for agroecology transitions. Um, so another kind of dynamic is uh, that people talked about a lot was that a lot of donors, and this is something that Nina really raised and a lot of the research has shown is that when agroecology is funded, it's a very kind of shallow version of agroecology that um, maybe meets those kind of levels um, one and two, but very rarely reaches levels four and five, um, uh, encouraging kind of polit these um, political processes in particular places. So pe funding or people talked about how funding organic does not necessarily mean agroecological because sometimes not always it misses the social and political dimensions that are super important for agroecology. Um, and also that a lot of the projects that, uh, that people referred to were, were when they focus on just level in one and two, they could actually be very damaging for agroecology and for people in, in a particular place. So someone says some of the things that are being funded has nothing to do with agroecology they're using child labor, cutting all the trees so there's no agroforestry. They're using airplanes to spread pesticides. Those who are producing are not benefiting. The market is completely outside the country. These are all things against agroecology principles, but when donors are saying, we're supporting agroecology by supporting levels one and two, they might be able to say that, but then there are all these other things that are happening. So unless, you, unless you're paying attention to these things, the, the social and the political, then there's the shallow agroecology is a, a really big problem or has been. So the idea was to focus on level four and five, but also to open up political, uh, to enable the political work that opens the space for agroecology. So people talked about, um, well, Paulo Peterson was one of the people that we talked to and he writes, it's a transformative perspective and we're not talking only about rural areas, but agri-food systems how to change structurally the agri-food system isn't just a technical question, but a political question. So we got to move beyond the, the technical, we've got to practices are really important. Farming practices, practices of building markets and things like this, but we need to have a systems and a political um, approach that, that combines the practice with the political if we are going to see the transformation that we want to see. Otherwise we're, we're tweaking things. And so um, a lot of donors were actually providing support for linking the practical and the political. Another dynamic was short versus long-term funding. So um, providing uh, long-term funding largely being uh, the kind of approach that, that supports a trans 
agroecology. Transformation is something that happens uh, a dime, but it's something that's long term. There are, of course, lots of important short term um, projects and initiatives and dynamics that contribute towards that. But um, this move towards more long term funding approaches was viewed as really important. So one of the donors funds for 10 to 12 years minimum using different phases to link up the small short term things into a longer term program. Um, and this was viewed as, as really um, uh, positively by the social movement farmers that we spoke with. Um, and that these long-term commitments are about this like co-governance as well and about connecting through um, kind of so approaches based on solidarity yeah, and building. One of those live things on a Zoom. So I'm very happy. I think some, someone needs to be muted there, I think. All right, cool. Um, so it, it's about more than just providing financing over a long term, but developing long term relationships. They've got workshops and things. So, <laughs> um, so another thing that people talked about as being really important is bringing on institutions and mainstream actors, but in a way that wasn't top down intervention. So bring it, so where um, you know scientists, policymakers, institutional actors come in and start running the show. Um, so not interventions by mainstream actors, but by enrolling them as kind of supporting actors where the protagonists of the show are still the grassroots organizations and farmers. And so um, the, so where then there were examples where local governments are being trained and turned into allies for agroecology through these kind of like um, bottom up processes where people are being brought in, in, in kind of, uh, subtle ways. And, and this quote here, um, one, one person said that working for agroecology rather than against pesticides was a really useful way to bring in some government officials in, in, and then bring them along around on the pesticide issue. So it was something that was interesting that people talked about. Um, and other things that people are doing are using seed fairs and demonstration sites to show how agroecology works bringing caravans of government officials through and then bringing and scientists and so forth and bringing them along and then again involving them in ways that don't um, don't put them in the driver's seat. Um, monitoring and measuring change and knowing change when we're talking about transformation again long-term things things that are very difficult to measure on short time frames and using conventional measures so people talked about having more flexible, multi-dimensional, long-term participatory monitoring. There were different examples that were prevent, presented. Um, people talked about, uh, there's a quote here about bringing ideas from political economy, feminism, ecological economics to better understand how we can monitor those kind of, those really important processes that are political and social that are, that when you actually, when you quantify them, you lose the essence of them. And so this is a real, challenge that I think that we're we're facing is that we want also want to we want to quantify agroecology change to understand it but then we miss a lot of what happens uh, what what's actually important um, so flexibility rather than being rigid and having everything having to be determined before a project even begins be, having things to be able to shift over time um, was important um, and so those were the, the kind of main operational things. And then there's, I think I'm onto them now, just a second. Yeah, there are three big picture things that we wanted to, to raise. The first is massive amount of inertia and resistance from mainstream donors. People talked about how there are donors that are blocking agroecology and not just donors, but big institutional actors. We see this a lot, agroecology being attacked. And we see there being divisions within and in between donors and institutions on the agroecology issue. Um, we see pe people talked about how um, kind of shifts towards thinking about how we solve crisis are great and important, um, but we also need to simultaneously think about uh, about transformation based on agroecology to address root problems. And so, uh, inertia and resistance in kind of shifting out of a of a charity and a a kind of like a, a band aid solution towards fundamental changes. Um, and then just like in particular focusing on agroecology as one small innovation or a niche that can be supported with a very small amount of, of funds to, to kind of like satisfy this demand for agroecology when actually a lot of these donors are supporting massive agricultural industrialization 
uh, programs. And so this is a, a big issue that people talked about. Uh, the next big issue is agroecology in the development machine can actually reproduce colonial and oppressive relationships. And so one person, um, one quote, agroecology can't just be another tool for colonization. It has to be congruent with the cosmovisions of people in particular places. Um, Agroecology funding should value and strengthen local efforts for justice and anti-oppression decolonization. Um, and also we have to recognize another quote that other approaches, for example, indigenous sovereignty that exist must be valued in their own right. Only then they can they can only then they can decide best ways to how to support and understand agroecology. So if it's not called agroecology, is it not going to get agroecology funding? Does everything now need to be called agroecology? This is a problem because a lot of really important work that, that reflects the tenets and the, the essence of agroecology, people aren't talking about it in terms of agroecology. So we need to be wary of that and mindful. And then the last bit is transformation is again about, is it really about a big picture? And actually, what, okay, I'll start with a quote. We can't just keep funding African CSOs to be the fighting the Goliath in our backyard. We need to do our part to clean up our backyard and erode the influence some actors are having in Africa. So if we focus on small projects, you know, say 1% of budgets to support or, and that's done really well to support agroecology and 99% of the financing development aid is going to support agro-industrialization and our, you know, political and political economic systems or economies are undermining um, kind of the global cells generally, if we don't address that, then these small projects that are focusing on agriculture, we need to be mindful of that. Otherwise, we're going to be swimming against the tide, and um, and that was super important to people. So again, this is all captured in this, you know, somewhat uh, hopefully useful um, table that we have that shows some of these dynamics. And ultimately, we hope to to like be able to prepare this in a way that people can then um, kind of take this into their own context and use to like think critically through what they're doing, whether they're a donor or to be able to ask donors to be able to shift what they do. But that's what, that's what the, um, that's the summary of it. And so what we want to do now is, is shift away from us because we've been talking far too long. I don't know what time it is, but I think we're close to on time. Um, and we're going to shift into smaller groups. Um, just give me one second. So I sent around a few times and I think Addy did to the link to the um, website. So we set up a page for this workshop on the website. And if you look down, you can see uh, the heading under number one resources for during the session, there's um, breakout group instructions. And so what we're gonna do for the next 30 minutes, as you know, we're gonna send you into groups of six. And the first thing we'd like you to do is to choose someone to facilitate, um, kind of light touch facilitation and someone to keep time just to make sure that everybody has a go, a chance to have a go. And we want to just start with a general round. Everybody can just like, what's in your mind after listening to all this, this um, barrage of information from Nina and Colin? How does it relate to your own experience and knowledge? Um, and just have a three minutes to have a go and go in a circle or what would be a circle if we could sit in a circle so that again, everybody has a chance to say something. If you have nothing to say, you can pass or if you can't fill up three minutes, that's fine, but try to keep it under three minutes. So again, so that we can respect that everyone has a chance to say something. And so then after that general round, the idea would be to have another go around where you try to react to something that someone else said in some way. I mean, and that's just a, that's just a, like a formal way to say, get talking, <laughs> you know, have a round where you all share something and then talk about it. But again, it'd be nice if there was a little go around so everybody has a chance to, to say something. And so that's it, that's the plan. And then when we come back, Nina's gonna take us through using a little online tool to collect some of the like main takeaways and, to, and we'll, we'll kind of collate those and put them on the, on the website afterwards so you can look at them if you want and a, a few other things. But for now, I'm gonna maybe ask Addy or Nina if there's anything I've missed or if there's any, yeah. No, on. this is great, Colin. This is uh, exactly what we're going to do. And we hope that, um, you know, that, 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 that you'll all stay because we're gonna be really interested in, in, in hearing your views. However, Colin, there was one question that came on the um, that that came on the the chat, um, which um, was about the table. Can you just scroll down on the website because I think there there is the table there. There was a confusion, and actually, I wasn't. I, I suddenly also felt confused 
look, the, the penultimate line, agroecology as central, agroecology as niche, people felt they should be up, like that they were, that there was a mistake and agroecology as niche should be works against transformative agroecology. Can you just say whether that's a mistake or else, could you just quickly explain how it is that agroecology as central works against and agroecology as needs, niche works for? I will look at it and change it while everybody breaks out because I you broke up. I couldn't hear what you said, but I think that there's a problem with the order. The yeah, again. Just, it's a question yeah. actually. Sorry, Colin. It's just a question. Is there a yeah. mistake um, on agroecology as niche? Yep, yeah, there is. That should be switched around for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, I'll change okay. it uh, so when people see view, so you can see that down on the web page there is this table as well, and you can check it out there if you feel like speaking to it when you break out, but don't feel stuck to that. Speak what's on your mind and in your heart, go for it. And um, and the other thing was, can, can, can Adi, can you repost the link again to the, to the website? Thanks a lot. Okay. Yay, so. But because it's so many of us, it's going to be really difficult to, to get people to speak up. So, so we've prepared um, we've prepared this little thing called, I don't know if, you, if, if some of you know Mentimeter, but um, basically I'm going to share my screen and then you're going to get some instructions. Um, share. So can you see these instructions? Oh, there's a chat there. I'm going to take that away. Um, so you go, basically you go to menti.com and you enter that code there, 5872112 in, in the little, um, you know, in the little text box that, that appears, or if you're, uh, that inclined, you can use this QR code that I'm now broadcasting to you. I'm going to leave this up for, for a little moment. So if you could all go, so you can do that on your phones, obviously, but you can also just, um, uh, you know, just minimize Zoom and open your browser and go to menti.com and enter this code. I'm going to repeat it in case there is somebody who can't see very well. That's 5872112. So if you're doing that, then um, maybe I'm going to do that myself just to make sure that it works. Then you come to um, this little tool called Mentimeter. And I'm going to get rid of the instructions now. There. There, we've already got some thumbs up. That's great. People are there, hooray. You can also put some thumbs down for some reason. Um, oh, there. So something maybe didn't work or maybe you're being funny or something has been crap. And hopefully we'll find that out. We'll, this, is just, this is just good or bad right now. Um, but in a minute we can, um, we'll hear from you. You can actually write something basically. Yay, people are there, people are coming. Going to wait a little bit longer. Are you saying that we have to leave this where we are now and go on, on your website? So what I'm saying is yes. So if I'm saying if you could now join the website called menti.com, it's a tool. Okay, it's a it's an online tool to. to yeah, but how do we join it? How do we join it without leaving this? You just do you know how to minimize um, your window? You, yeah. Yeah. So you just yeah. minimize it. You'll stay on. You can keep hearing me and um, open a new window and open a new window and then you just you just go to menti.com and you use this code that you should still i can repeat it to you if if it's difficult for you to to keep it in mind so at menti.com you use the code five eight seven two double one two and then you enter 
And so I'm going to move on now um, from this. You can still come in, so it doesn't matter um, if you're late. And basically, the idea is now that, that you can share your ideas, thoughts, questions from your breakout group discussion um, on, our, on our session. And, and so this could be anything you discussed or thought of, something that stood out, something you particularly liked, or something that you found questionable or problematic. And also, it can be questions that you've had that you've wanted to ask us that, um, that you weren't able to because of this uh, you know, a large group of people um, has made it more difficult maybe to do you know, questions and answers directly. And the chat was also hard to keep track of. So I'm not sure whether we missed anything. There we go. And so um, for those of you who are um, not on Zoom, if you, if you go back to Zoom, basically you will, you will see the things that people are now saying on the shared screen, on my shared screen. Um, linking the challenge of regional food systems with decolonizing global food systems, appreciating the focus on territorial zones. How can agroecological producers thrive and survive without dependence on volunteers and grants? power of collective cooperative funding models. We had some really interesting discussion on the tension between funding agroecological projects from the market via grant or state funding. Both have complexities and this is a challenge. Agroecology is still, still not well defined or understood. So this can have complications for raising funds for it, making it more mainstream and overcoming criticisms about it. Very interesting, the hunger for change from smaller farming operations compared to larger and is agroecology incompatible with larger farming operations. Equitable access to land is a huge issue that needs to be overcome for sure. Which kind of conventional farming are usually getting the funds and for which kind of projects is a question. So the the majority of the funding that we looked at that went to conventional agriculture um, you know was was very large scale funding and often it was um, used to support the agricultural sector in developing countries so it wouldn't be necessarily one particular farm that would get the funding but it it would um, um, it would for example be the government in order to implement um, a better early warning system, um, weather warning system, for example. Sometimes money would be there to improve roads so that there would be access roads for, um, you know, in, in rural areas. I hope that helps. It's interesting how UK government is supporting small farming in the period of conversion from conventional to organic, which doesn't occur well in Brazil. Somebody, they, this question was also asked in the chat, by the way, would like to know more about enhanced people's monitoring frameworks on the Brazil example. I can't speak to that. I don't know if you can, Colin. Sorry, I missed that. We'll, we'll, there was some- we'll um, Oh, we would like to enhance people's mind. Um, if that person wants to follow up with me by email, I could do that. I, um, I, I'm gonna leave our emails in the chat in a second. Great. Funders agreeing to design principles rather than clearly defined activities and outcome to enable localized approaches, relinquishing control. Better public awareness to generate more funding. Yes, maybe. I just wonder whether it is really the public awareness or whether it is a, a very specific institutional awareness that needs to be generated. Is agroecology possible without large-scale governmental intervention? Colin, what is your opinion on that? <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> um, but uh, I think a lot of it is um, unpacking and undoing a lot of the current... I know there were questions asked about how to make agroecology financially viable. And a lot of the reason why it isn't viable is because it's in a context that disables it from being, being viable and that the um, cost price squeeze the, the small 
um, the, the kind of push towards supporting industrialization of agriculture and markets that support that are at large, increasingly large scales and a retail and food system that that doesn't support small scale diversified agro ecological farmers, all these things work against it. And so I think a lot of the work is actually to get to get government to stop create enabling the context that disables agroecology um, and that community self organization and finding ways to enable that is just one part of the the process. So the large scale interventions by government needs to be about deconstructing a system that's really toxic and disabling. Yeah. In my view. And what kind of funding for finance for smallholder farmers for agroecology did you discover? So, I mean, in the in the quantitative study on actual funding flows, uh, as you know, there wasn't very much um, funding that was properly for agroecology. But but the the best examples that um, that we found were actually from the Green Climate Fund, and um, they they were supporting, you know, like la like often sort of regional territorial um, initiatives. Um, really focusing on uh, short food chains, focusing on um, you know, local markets, also often national markets, also sometimes export markets, but uh, working with um, uh, non-timber non forest products, for example, diversifying uh, peasant farms and um, working with, uh, you know, like a, a sort of an integrated approach that had also nutrition at its heart, working with, working with people to, to improve um, their diets. Cookie cutter approaches, says, something, says somebody. That sounds interesting friends of citizens rather than consumers as drivers of say change yep what critical mass is required to overthrow the funding system is agroecology really possible without this i mean it is a really good question um the worry is less the worry for me is less that there isn't a lot of money there for agroecology but that there is so much money going to fund all these incredibly huge development projects, not just agricultural, but I mean, the agricultural sector, the agricultural uh, um, development assistance is just a fraction of development assistance. And so much of that goes towards concrete, asphaltation, technology, mining. There's loads coming. I, I, I hesitate to, to stop you, but, um, but basically um, I'm, I, I will. I will start a countdown. Uh, um, a question in the chat about whether people will be able to access these, uh, this meant like yeah. breakdown. So, Nina, maybe, say, I could, maybe I could wrap up then on that note. Is that all right? Yeah. So we... Um, we plan to take all of these comments and to pop them up on that web page that we've shared around. So everybody should bookmark that web page, the Agroecology Now ORFC Finance web page. Maybe you can send it around again, Eddie. Um, so you can all have access to them. Um, you'll have you know links to different information on that um, website as well, different reports. Almost all of the reports that have been done on this topic are on there, or the ones that we're aware of. And then will be the part that I presented actually hasn't been published anywhere yet. And we'll be publishing a policy brief in the next um, 30 to 60 days or something like that, which will be on there. And generally, if you want to stay connected with us, the best thing to do is to, you know, follow our social media, keep an eye on the website, connect with us via email, which I've shared around. I'm just popping in. Um, uh, oops, did I send that to everyone? No, nope, I just sent that to Chris. Let me see. Send this to everyone. Shoot. Okay, I'm gonna pop in this link, which is to one last form, which is um, an opportunity for you to give us some feedback on the session. You know, this is a experiment for us and in, in running a session like this, we'd love to hear back from you. But also, if you have any comments, questions about the research or anything itself, it's a spot you could you could reach out to us. Um, the last part we were gonna do, but we're gonna cut it short because we don't have time, is just to say, if you want to act on this what can we do? And we were going to kind of crowdsource this too via Mentimeter, but instead um, I'll just quickly say, well, well, our emphasis has always been on, on connecting with other people, taking collective action, 
looking for social movements and social movement organizations in the territory you're in, in the country you're in, and internationally, and seeing what's happening in that regard and contributing your energy to those collaborative efforts. And that's the best place. And so without more time to elaborate on that, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, and again, invite you all to connect with us. I'll just give Nina or Addy a chance to, to say anything if I've missed something, but really enjoyed the session. Wish we could all be there together um, another time to connect and really happy to, to connect with people by email bilaterally or however, for you, however is appropriate for and desirable for you. So Nina, Addy, anything? No, great. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, for wrapping that up so nicely. And yes, I'm really sad. I wanted to hear there is a little bit more. Some people are writing. So there's another slide up now on Menti, another question you can you can answer. You can put your, your ideas there. But like Colin said, the form will also be really helpful for us both to, you know, improve potential future sessions of this kind, but also to hear back from you and be in touch. Um, just Google us. I think Nina Muller at Coventry University and Colin Anderson, Coventry University, just search engine uh, actually comes up with our, with our, with our email addresses. So um, uh, it, it felt like a really rich session. There was so much. I saw a question was whether, whether the mentee suggestions, these ideas would, would, would be made available. I believe that I can save these. And so our idea was that we would make them available on, on, the, on the website, the Agroecology Now website. Isn't that right, Colin? That's right, yeah. So um, that's great. Yeah, please feel free to, to populate them. I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep it open. I see some things are coming in and um, looks great. Maybe I should just quickly share my screen again. I'll share my screen so people can see the last few mentees and we'll say bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.